the Eucharist is really Jesus. Yes, Catholics believe this, despite what you may have heard or understood if you are, let's say, a grew up Catholic and don't attend Catholic Mass anymore, weren't catechized. If you're a non-Catholic Christian and thinking, what, what? Yes, Catholics believe that Jesus is, the Eucharist really is Jesus. Okay, so this week on the show, why? Why do we believe that? What's that grounded in? Where does that come from? Why is that important? Why is it fundamental that you have a proper understanding of that for, for what happens and what the New Testament, the New Covenant is all about? Salvation history, the whole plan of God hinges on understanding that, yeah, the Eucharist is really Jesus, and that is so important. This week, Joe Heschmeyer joins me to unpack all of that in an absolute slam dunk of an episode. I think you'll love it. If you wonder about this, you hear people talking about the, the, the Eucharist and have, have, have no idea, or if you've seen videos of, of Protestant apologists saying, yeah, 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 Jesus is present in communion. I, I believe that. Well, Joe says, no, not quite. This is what Catholics believe. What the early church believed really what Christians have believed for a very, very long time, since the beginning, since the road to Emmaus where Christ revealed himself to the disciples after his resurrection, why this is important this week on the show. Please enjoy. Hey friends, welcome back to the show. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are listening on podcasts, thank you. Uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, make sure you leave a rating or review for the show. That helps to push the podcast out to new people. And thank you. If you're watching on YouTube, hello. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell. Leave some comments below. <laughs> there, you know this, Joe. There are a wide variety of, of commenters on YouTube, uh, and it's always enjoyable to, to kind of uh, uh, get some feedback on on a video. And you know this too. Also, Joe, that the, the harshest critics, uh, those comments just help to drive more views to the video. So thank you for all you guys for interacting with the video. Even the angry ones, uh, you guys helped to uh, to make this thing uh, go. So thank you. My guest this week, I may have already uh, let it slip, is uh, is Joe Heschmeyer. Joe is an apologist at Catholic Answers, uh, the author of a number of the, the absolute finest books, including Pope Peter, Defending the Church's Most Distinctive Teaching, The Early Church Was the Catholic Church, and uh, for our purposes here this week, the Eucharist is really Jesus, how Christ's body and blood are the key to everything we believe. All those from Catholic Answers Press. He is, of course, the host of, um, I, I think, Joe, my favorite podcast these days, Shameless Popery. Uh, I can't think of a podcast I, I wait for more expectantly every week, Joe, than yours these days. So uh, kudos on that and welcome to the Thank show, you. Joe. <laughs> Thanks that was a very generous introduction. I'm I'm flattered. Um, I, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I was thinking of this. I don't want to. I don't want to necessarily insult all the other apologists out there because then they won't want to come on my show, Joe. And That's I'll one solely, yeah. solely, on, solely on you. But I think you are one of my. You know, maybe if not my favorite working apologist these days, Joe. This, 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 the the way I, I don't know if this is this sounds weird, Joe. But the way your brain works, the way you unpack topics and and treat them from. Uh, it just is like, it, I feel like, yes, this is it. This is the guy. <laughs> I don't want to devour your stuff, Joe. I think you have a great way of tackling, you know, objections by using those objections and the sources those objectors use to explain how, well, you know what, that, that author there says other, other things too about, about that aspect of, of Christianity. And combine that with, with you know, er, the early church, combine that with really uh, amazing biblical studies. I mean, I, there were some recent episodes of the show, Joe, you've just gone into, you know, a 45 minute Bible study on like this really <laughs> intense topics. It's, it's, it's thrilling stuff, Joe. <laughs> Oh, I appreciate stuff. that. Thank you. No, it, it's it's a lot of fun to do, and I like that I can kind of, I don't even want to say sneak a Bible study in there because it's pretty <laughs> obvious what I'm doing, but you know, being able to just say, let's do a deep dive yeah, on, on this yeah, passage yeah, yeah, because yeah. so often I feel like a lot of apologetics is kind of rapid fire back and forth yeah. citations to chapter and verse, and it's worthwhile to just pause and say, wait, are we understanding this verse? correctly let's look at the context let's look at yeah. you know maybe what did the early christians think this meant and are they right <laughs> you know th those can be helpful <laughs> because so often i think one of the reasons we talk back like past each other is we're so used to reading scripture through a certain hermeneutic yeah. so you know you're reading the epistle to the romans and you've just gotten your, your mind like romans wrote you know like this is just the way you're reading it that paul is just taking a long time to make four bullet points and then it's like well maybe or maybe he's doing something else there instead. And, you know, how did the early Christians read it? And what are the commentaries on it that we find early on? 
is there another way of reading this same stuff where it's not a matter of do I believe Paul or not? It's a matter of what is Paul saying compared to what am I imagining Paul saying? Yeah. You know, who who yeah. is he writing yeah. to? Yeah. What's he writing against? And that that kind of thing is a lot of fun to get to do a deep dive on. And I'll tell you, like, I really benefit personally from getting to do that. And there are times where I hear an objection and I go exploring and think, oh wow, like here's this whole area of the faith I'd maybe never thought deeply about or I'd never explored. And so it's a lot of fun. And so I, I hope other people enjoy it uh, as much as I enjoy getting to do it. <laughs> I hope so, too. And I'll put links to the show notes, Joe, for your uh, first name was Popery, a fantastic. Listen, an awesome blog title way back when that you, that you still use. Awesome podcast name and a, and a, and a wicked podcast, Joe. I love it. And uh, I really it's... like Cordial Catholic. I like the implicit uh, <laughs> suggestion that other Catholics are not as nice as you. <laughs> I think that's very cordial of you. <laughs> oh gosh, that, that's not that you know. I know I'm joking, Joe. It's always been. <laughs> you were so genuinely I'm, nice to yeah, me. I'm, I'm yeah, like thanks, teasing you at the, at the gate. That's, that's a bad idea. It's a it's an aspirational <laughs> title. Ask my wife, and I'm I'm nowhere nice. near there yet. So it's one of those bars to achieve. So if I, you know if I call if I call it the cordial Catholic, I have to rise rise to the occasion. And honestly, Joe, it has. It's it like has. having <laughs> a, a religious bumper sticker. You drive so much nicer if you do it that. Is, you're just like, well, true. okay, I'm making this statement. I'm not going to cut that guy off in traffic. Absolutely. That's This is just a bumper sticker of a podcast. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Joe, uh, your new book is The Eucharist is Really Jesus. Talk about just putting it out there, right? I love that that, that title just, uh, yep, this is this is the deal, guys. Yep. It's, it's, it's quite clear. I love that. Much like the early church is the Catholic church, right? I, I think we're just like, yeah, here are the cards, here's the table. I'm There you go, challenge accepted kind of thing. Yeah, I, 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 I'm working on a podcast for uh, two weeks from now. I'm I'm like unusually ahead of the game because I'm getting right. We're, we're about to have a baby, so <laughs> I've got to be a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but in in there, I'm I'm responding to a Baptist secessionist, and it's J. M. Carroll, and his book is popularly known as The Trail of Blood, but the full title is The Trail of Blood Following Christians Down Through the Centuries, or The History of Baptist Church from the Time of Christ to Their Founder to the Present Day. And I was like, man, I want more titles like that. That is an amazing title. (laughs) Everything in the book is wrong, but the title is so good. Oh, that's fantastic. I I love that. And I thought the Catholic were the, were the gory kind of, gro- you know, with relics and, and saint, body parts of saints. But the, this, this trail of blood is, that's very alive. Yeah, that's, yeah uh, I mean, he, he claims that the Catholic yeah, Church killed it. 50 million Baptists throughout history yeah. in, in the Dark Ages, he says, which yeah. is amazing because no historians even discovered Baptists existed then. <laughs> And well, it turned out just 50 million of them died at a time when Europe didn't even have 50 million. I was going to say, even from a population study standpoint, that, that oh, yeah, no, it, it's one of the things I'm exploring. It's like yeah, this is yeah. literally impossible. I, I love it. I love too, I should say, Joe, that you are very charitable also in your, your examination of these things too on, on your podcast, in your work. I right? try to be. I mean, I, I'm kind of poking fun here, but I don't want to, you know, if someone is inclined to that view, and I come off as like immediately smug and dismissive. They're going to just yeah. dismiss me and, and reasonably so. Yeah. And so it's something yeah. I, I strive for. Um, but, you know, I, I have kind of a wry sense of humor. And so I have to check that because it can seem kind of uh, uh, kind of jerkish if I'm yeah. not careful. That's why I like you so much, Joe. It's wonderful. Okay, you begin this book with, I think, uh, one of my absolute favorite illustrations of what the Eucharist is. And I think it's so fascinating. We, we you know, the, the road to Emmaus, the, the disciples, you know, walking with, with Jesus, who didn't, they don't know who he is until, of course, uh, well, the, the whole point of this thing, right? When he reveals himself, I, uh, I encountered that, I think, I think, I don't know where I originally heard that the story explained that way, but it was really early on in my own conversion journey. And I think I was driving. I think I actually pulled the car over. And I think Joe began to weep. And I'm an emotional guy. And since I've been kids, I've become more emotional. But I I hadn't heard that that presented in that way before as, you know, kind of explaining the Eucharist, what it was and how it is actually Jesus, until I heard that explanation. And I was floored to, to hear that. And there's... It's unmistakable, right? I often think of this way. There's there's connections we can make in the Bible, right? John John six is one of them. Uh, these different things we can connect in the Bible, and it's easy to dismiss those as uh, I think the um, also the nativity, right? The idea of of the parallels between King David and the Ark and and Mary and uh, and Elizabeth at the at the um, right at yeah, the visitation, the visitation yeah. right? These there are connections that that are made by the gospel writers that are just 
mind blowing. And, and you can dismiss that as, 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 and this is one of them. And you can dismiss that as saying, okay, so uh, that's a coincidence and Catholics are reading, reading too much into this. But if you say that you also, on the other hand, have to admit the Bible is inspired. Yeah. And if that's in there and the Bible is inspired, you have to wrestle with why an inspired author, you know, why God would include that in the Bible if those connections that seem so apparent weren't meant to be made. And yeah, like why, why would God that. let the Bible be super misleading? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here's what, here's one of them, right, that I think is just so fascinating that we have to wrestle with, especially as a non-Catholic Christian. So I want you to maybe to, to unpack the introduction to the book, The Road to Emmaus, how that kind of shows who, how the Eucharist is really Jesus. Yeah. Then we'll kind of, you know, uh, uh, unpack that a bit further afterwards, maybe. So okay. what, Great. Do, what do you say with that? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I'd say is it's Easter Sunday and there are two disciples who are walking on the road to Emmaus. These are not apostles. These are disciples. And they're talking as they go, because at this point um, they have been following Jesus. They thought he was a Messiah, but then he's been killed. And then there's this mysterious report from the women that they've gone to the empty tomb and found it empty and seen an angel. They haven't seen Jesus yet. In fact, the, of the two people walking, one of them is named Clopas or Cleopas. And if this is the same Clopas that we see in the New Testament, his wife, Mary, is one of the women who's at the empty tomb. So that might explain who these two are. We don't know that part for sure. We just know these two disciples have heard the report of the empty, of, of the empty tomb from the women but they're, they're mystified. And so Jesus is walking with them, but they don't know it's Jesus. And along the way, he's explaining that this isn't some thwarting of the messianic plan, that in fact, the suffering of the Messiah is something that had been built into the, the whole story from the beginning. And so beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explains all of these parts of scripture concerning himself. Now, you might imagine that would be it, that you, this is the greatest preaching the greatest homily, the greatest sermon of all time, Jesus himself is saying, here are all of these Christological parts of the Old Testament. And yet they still don't really get it. They don't know the person walking with them is Jesus. They're not putting all the pieces together. The critical turning point actually comes when they arrive in Emmaus and Jesus joins them. It's now evening. And so they, they join for the meal and, uh, it, we're told at table with them, he, Jesus, took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. Yeah. So there's a few things to notice there. First, this is very liturgical language that, you know, Luke is not telling you these four steps, you know, taking, blessing, breaking, giving, uh, because he doesn't think you know how to eat bread. You know, like there's obviously <laughs> something else going on here. And if you check that language with the way the synoptic gospels describe the institution of the Eucharist, you'll find those same four verbs being used. That this is not an accidental parallel. This is a liturgical looking action. And this is really hammered home by the second thing that when Luke is going to describe this after this, he talks about how the two disciples run back to Jerusalem and announce how Christ was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now, the breaking of the bread <laughs> is how Luke describes the early Christian Eucharist in Acts 2 and other places. And so if you missed the liturgical kind of verbiage, this liturgical phrase, the breaking of the bread, this was not just they had a meal together. They recognized Christ in the breaking of the bread. And so, you know, you were talking about your light bulb moment with this passage. Mine was actually seeing that text written over the tabernacle in the cathedral of St. Matthew in Washington, wow. DC, <laughs> and just being like, Oh, I've never noticed that phrasing. Like, yeah, of course that's Eucharistic sounding. But then there's another dimension to this as well. It's at this point, only after they recognize Christ in the breaking of the bread, only after this kind of Eucharistic light bulb moment that the two disciples say to one another, we're not our hearts burning within us as he explained the scriptures on the way. So it, what I'm trying to do in the book is both show Christ is there in the breaking of the bread, that the Eucharist really is Jesus. And that this makes sense of scripture. This makes sense of everything else that Christ's body and blood are the key to everything. We believe those two ideas, the second Vatican council describes the Eucharistic sacrifice as the source and the summit. So the summit meaning like the high point, 
this is the best part of the faith. This is the most intimacy with Jesus possible this side of heaven. But also the source of the Christian faith, that in a real way, everything flows from the Eucharist and makes sense of the whole of Christianity and makes sense of the whole of the church, that you can't properly understand the new covenant, you can't properly understand the church without understanding the Eucharist, and that this is actually what Scripture teaches over and over again. <laughs> That's fantastic, Joe. And it, it always floored me, too, when Jesus breaks the bread and vanishes. Yeah. Right? Like, no, he's actually still there, right, in the, in the, in the, right. In the Eucharist. That, that, to me, is such a... F- interesting turn of phrase like you know he vanishes and then like you say the the, there luke doubles down on the fact that they knew him in the it wasn't after explaining all these things they don't say oh after this really intense bible study then we got that it was jesus it was in that breaking of the bread that liturgical act that they realized it was it, it was him i that's incredible and i i do like one of these things if if scripture if we're taking the gospel as inspired work how do we Explain that apart from something is going on there liturgically with with the Eucharist. Right? Yes, I don't... It, this is something to take very serious because you have, we haven't even talked about this part, like the whole structure of the journey is the structure of the Mass and yes, not just yeah, the Mass yeah. today. If you go back and read St. Justin Martyr's first apology in 160, when he describes in paragraph, uh, what is it, 60 or so? Uh, the order of the mass, it gets to paragraph 65. I don't remember what chapter he starts in. Uh, He explains everything that happens when Christians come together on Sunday. And the pattern follows the modern mass and it follows the road to Emmaus, which is to say the people come together. There's reading of scripture. There's commentary on scripture, you know, the preaching. And then you have the gathering around the table, the altar, You have the breaking of the bread, the institution of the Eucharist. You have the reception of the Eucharist, and you have the sending forth. And we see all of that in the road to Emmaus. You have a kind of liturgy of the word on the road. You have a liturgy of the Eucharist once they get to Emmaus, and then you have the dismissal. And the dismissal is where the word mass comes from, that we're empowered by the Eucharist, we're fueled by the Eucharist, and we're sent forth. We're dismissed uh, to go forth and proclaim that Christ is made known in the breaking of the bread and then our hearts were burning within us while he mm-hmm. talked to us on the road. Yeah. And, you know, I, I read this passage and heard sermons in this passage and, and, and Bible studies in this passage as an evangelical. And we critically missed that part of the breaking of the bread, right? The idea was, oh, Jesus explained, explained through scripture, through the Old Testament, the prophets, New Testament, who he was and the disciples understood and believed and went out and then made more disciples, right? We missed that critical part. That it, no, 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 it wasn't through the Bible study that Jesus right. was made known. It was in that, the breaking of the bread as the kind of the final act, say, like, here's what we do, oh, right? I am, <laughs> I am Eucharist. Like that was, yeah, and a, a huge difference, right? To, to stop and recognize that that's when he was, he was made known. I think that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, because so in verse 32, they say, you know, we're not our hearts burning within us. Well, he talked to us on the road when he opened to us the scriptures. But critically, they don't realize that at the time. They are not saying, our hearts are burning within us. You must be Jesus. There's nothing of that. They still don't recognize him. Oh, it's only when they recognize him in the Eucharist that they're able to retroactively make sense of the scriptural kind of interpretation and realize the importance of it. Those, those kind of aha moments come after the Eucharistic light bulb. They don't come before it. And that is, I think a really important and intentional decision by the inspired author to stress that, that it's it's not, they got this at the time Jesus said it, they have the benefit of hindsight and they're able to make sense of what Jesus was saying on the road now that they are seeing it in light of the Eucharist and in light of realizing it was Jesus. Yeah. Okay. So the Eucharist is, you already quoted Vatican Council, the, the source and summit, right, of uh, our, our faith as Catholics. And I think, you know, there, there's a, a, a growing trend of, of, of Protestants, of evangelical brothers and sisters coming to, to recognize more the importance of, of the Eucharist. Right, this idea that, okay, I, I can believe in the real presence in a certain sense in, in the Eucharist, in communion, because I see it. This is what the early church believed. Right, you've done awesome work on on in your other book, the early church was Catholic, explaining why the, the, the church believed this and and how universally it was understood that that Christ was present in the Eucharist. 
Um, the, the, it's a trend, but the idea more and more these days is to recognize the role of the early church in, in Christianity and to begin to accept them. Thinking of like, uh, Francis Chan, others who are right, who are, uh, very publicly recognizing that, okay, something's happening here in, in communion. The early church believed this. We have to recognize that, right? You read things like, like John six, like, like, you know, uh, Jesus at, at the last supper, these words seem very, very literal. Uh, getting closer to what Catholics believe about the Eucharist, but not quite there. So I wonder if you could unpack, I and mean, you have a whole chapter on this, and there's lots of detail in here, so you can pick and choose how you want to unpack this, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, if I, if I ask you, you know, what do Catholics believe about the Eucharist? Right. <laughs> so the Eucharist <laughs> is Jesus. And this is, I think, an important way of saying it, because when we talk about the language of presence, that can sound a little mushy. So maybe backing up a little bit. Many modern Protestants, many modern evangelicals and Baptists have a merely symbolic view of the Eucharist. Yeah. But that's not particularly historical, even within Protestantism. That the Protestant reformers had a much higher view of the Eucharist, that they believed Christ was in with and under the bread and wine. In Luther's case, that there was some kind of spiritual present. In Calvin's case, although he was notoriously vague on this issue, even Zwingli seems to give a little more than modern evangelicals often give. And so you, you find someone like Francis Chan who has these kind of aha moment of realizing like, oh, this is totally not how anyone read these passages until the Reformation. And in many cases, long after the Reformation, that maybe there's another and better way of understanding that if this was a metaphor, this was a metaphor that was lost on everybody for three quarters of the church's history. And so we shouldn't be so quick to assume it's just a metaphor. We shouldn't be so quick to assume it's just a symbol. And even, I mean, I don't know how deep into the weeds you want to go on this. I don't really <laughs> cover this part in the book. But even the early Christian understanding of symbol, especially when you look at people like St. Augustine, who's coming from a Platonic background, the notion of the relationship between symbol and reality was very different. And in some cases, almost the inverse of what modern people think of as symbol. You know, if yeah, something yeah, is a yeah. symbol, we think it's not real. Whereas... To the ancients, the symbols were participations in the real, the real form. And so there's a whole different kind of conceptual worldview where even the idea of just symbol was, was so radically different. So all that's to say, the modern evangelical misconception of the Eucharist, which is just one kind of species of Protestant Eucharistic theology, is new and wrong in a pretty obvious way kind of way. I don't mean obvious to the people who believe it. I mean, obvious once you step back and look at history and look at the evidence and hear the different competing arguments like, oh, yeah, this this is clearly missing something. And so in response to that, in response to people like Francis Chan, you've got Protestants who say, well, hold on, you know, maybe the evangelical view isn't enough. You don't need to go fully Catholic. You can settle for some kind of view of presence, you know, consubstantiation or something and go back to something like what Luther or Calvin might have believed where there's a, a spiritual presence or Christ is present among the bread and wine, but we don't have to go fully Catholic. And usually when these conversations happen, they'll say, well, transubstantiation, you know, that's this Aristotelian category. And, and that's not really true, but this is the argument. This is all this kind of like medieval scholastic Aristotelian metaphysics. And, and again, this, this is plainly, untrue. Uh, Jimmy Aiken actually has a great article responding to Father Thomas Reese on this point, that the language of transubstantiation is actually older than the medieval embrace of Aristotle. And so it's a mistake to, to read it kind of through that lens. Nevertheless, it, it's easy for people to get lost in the weeds on transubstantiation versus consubstantiation, et cetera. So to cut through the kind of Gordian knot, I just say, look, do you worship the Eucharist? Yes or no? Because yeah, if you don't, then yeah, we yeah, yeah. believe something really radically different. You know, Ignatius of Antioch in 107 tells us not to have communion with the Gnostics because they don't confess the Eucharist to be the flesh and blood of Jesus. Now, that's big. The, the, the whole argument is not Christ is somehow present here. No, the argument is the Eucharist is Jesus bodily present. Now, we can get into the philosophy of how he's bodily present. But that's not nearly as important as the fact yeah. that he is bodily present. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, John Bergsma, Dr. John Bergsma mentioned that, you know, Ignatius saying that it was the same flesh that hung on the cross yes. and suffered for us. That's for him what convinced him of, of the Catholic Church was, okay, I can't, I can't deny that <laughs> these early Christians understood the Eucharist to be, be Jesus, right, in, in that way. Yeah, absolutely. That it's, again, it's not just a question of presence, but a question of identity. And that makes a very clear distinction. I In the book, I mentioned this, that I used this in conversation with a Lutheran who was considering the Catholic Church. And she was kind of surprised because, you know, she had a high Eucharistic theology for a yeah. Protestant. But when I asked, do you worship the Eucharist? It was kind yeah. of like, well, of course not. And well, <laughs> we do. This is, this is a big difference. Now we don't have to... Uh, imagine this is a question of some subtlety in the same way that, you know, I don't know how familiar your viewers slash listeners are with kind of the debates in the early church, but there, the whole famous notion of an iota's worth of difference between homoousia and homoousia. And if you just look at the Greek words, you're like, oh, this looks almost identical. Why does it matter? <laughs> but the whole question was, is Christ consubstantial with the father or is he of a similar substance to the father? Because if you say the wrong thing, you're no longer believing yeah. in the divinity yeah. of Christ. Yeah. All that's to say, the technical sounding language is often there to safeguard and preserve really important, really fundamental truths. But it can be helpful for ordinary non-philosophical people to just hear like, okay, here's what's at stake in this technical sounding debate. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I'm thinking of two things. And the first is I had uh, Dr. Ken, uh, Kenneth Howell on this show a while ago now, a few years ago, and he's got a PhD in, in linguistics and a PhD in like church history. Uh, so two good good fields to tackle this. He wrote, wrote a book on the Eucharist. And he told me that he'd, he's read every single quote on the Eucharist, every single ever mentioned in all the church fathers, you know, in his, in his you know, long and esteemed career, right? And he, and he said, I, I know language. I know what the language means. And, and like you pointed out, right, when we think of, you know, Augustine using the idea of Eucharist as a symbol, mm -hmm. I said, well, what, what, what is this, Dr. Howell? What is, he goes, no, no, no. He said, anybody that ever tells you that any of the church fathers believed that this was symbolic, don't understand what they mean by, by yes. symbol. He said, universally, because I, I want to see if we can give a little wiggle room, because there, there are some, you know, quotes you can find out there that sound really like maybe the church father doesn't quite believe it. And he said, he said no, yeah. no. He said, I'm going to put my cards, I'm, there's no way. Absolutely, I can tell you, hundred percent. Every church father believed it was the real, you know, in the idea of Christ being present in the, in 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 the Eucharist. So I said, okay, well, you know, he said he he knows, <laughs> he knows this stuff. And the second is your your test. I love that of of worship. Like that's that's. I, you know, I love how your brain works, Joe. I love this. This is exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about here. When you these kind of little these kind of things like that's what an amazing way of of just teasing out all the 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 confusion there all the debate there do you worship the eucharist or not right i yeah. love that because you're gonna get that you, no right. matter how you want to finesse your view of the eucharist right whether christ is kind of spiritually present and i uh, mean or whether he's really there you, if you're gonna say you believe in the real presence okay yeah but do you worship that yes or no like that is I love that, Joe. <laughs> and the same, you know, it, it just, it's one of those cut to the chase kind of moments. Yeah, like if someone says, is, oh, yeah. you know, the Trinity is just Greek philosophy, you can say, well, do you believe there's one God? Do you yeah. believe Jesus is God? Do you believe Jesus is not the Father? And if you can say yes to those three things, and do you believe the Holy Spirit is God, do you believe the Holy Spirit is not the Father? Well, you've got the Trinity. <laughs> you might not have the language for it, but that's what we're talking about when we talk about the Trinity. Yeah. Uh, and so likewise... In this case, so going back to the question of language and, and specifically the issue of St. Augustine, I saw this recently. I replied to Dr. Gavin Ortland on some of his stuff about Mary, and he argues that Augustine seems inconsistent, and, you know, contradictory in terms of the veneration of the saints. And it only is inconsistent and contradictory through a Protestant hermeneutic. And this is sure. something that is worth considering, that if Protestants are right, then you have to imagine that there's two different camps of early church fathers on the Eucharist because some of the early church fathers are so abundantly clear on the Eucharist being Jesus that there's no way to deny it. You, you have to say, yeah, I just don't agree with what this guy is saying. Yeah, yeah. And then others, you as you said, there's a little more wiggle room. Like maybe you can interpret them in a Protestant way. Maybe you can interpret them in a Catholic way. The problem with them interpreting them in a Protestant way is twofold. Number one, 
they you have to imagine that there's two different theological camps, but that these theological camps never argue against each other right, on this yeah, most yeah, important yeah. doctrine. We never find them writing, you know, uh, contra Augustinianum. You know, there's there's nothing where like Jerome and Augustine are going at it yeah. on how one of them's a heretic on the Eucharist. We just don't find that. And in fact, Augustine is brought into Christianity by St. Ambrose of Milan who has some of the clearest stuff on Eucharistic theology you're going to find in the early church. And so we would have to believe that Augustine contradicts Ambrose and both of them are just cool with it. And they don't feel the need to address this fact yeah. or, or kind of sort this out. And what's more, you have to view Augustine as being against Augustine because there are other places, you know, when he, you know, for instance, uh, when he talks about Christ holding himself in his own hands at the last supper, where it's like, okay, well, this is pretty clearly, a very realist view of the Eucharist. And so you find this even among Protestant historians of the early church, that if they're going to be consistent in, in believing that there was something like a Protestant view of the Eucharist out there, they have to imagine this kind of schizophrenia within the church fathers or a kind of quasi schism within the early church that nobody in the early church had noticed somehow. You know, so for instance, I'm thinking of J.N.D. Kelly, who's fantastic Protestant historian, I think he's Anglican, uh, I'm not 100% sure, I think he's Anglican, a uh, historian of the early church. And he admits that in this period, most of the fathers are unquestionably realists. And he's uncomfortable with that, but he's going to posit that there's some who might be just uh, symbolic. And the problem with that, again, is what I've said, that you, you have to interpret this with such a lack of continuity between church fathers or even within this, this same person's of law, you know, their, their opus of writing, you know, like you have to view them as self-contradictory. The Catholic view says, no, the Eucharist is an efficacious sign, like all the sacraments. So the Eucharist is real, but it also has a sign value. Yeah. But symbol isn't contradictory to reality. You know, in a wedding, when the couple says, I do, that's symbolic, but it's also real. It really is doing something you are now wed. Uh, God could have made some sort of, uh, you know, a wedding ceremony or designed the form of marriage such that the couple says, I don't, I don't promise this. And that was how weddings happened. But then the sign, you know, the external thing would contradict the internal thing. So the sign, the I do, that's a symbolic level, creates a real thing, a wedding, a union, a marriage. And so, you know, this notion is something that, we, you know, we, in other words, all that's a very long-winded way of saying there's no such thing as symbol versus reality in the early church. A uh, very last example, uh, because Augustine is great on this. When he's talking about the wedding feast of Cana, he's talking about the stone jars. And if memory serves, there's six stone jars in John 2. And he argues that this represents the six days of creation and stands for the old order that is going to be renewed and redeemed, that the water becoming wine shows marriage and the whole Jewish system being transformed and enriched by Christ. Now he doesn't think that the six stone jars didn't exist. He thinks they're real. He thinks they're also symbols. And so trying to pick and choose one of those two categories misunderstands the way a lot of the early church fathers think. Yeah, that's fantastic. And the, I guess the third option, Joe, is a huge conspiracy, right? Friend, good friend of the show, Rod Bennett, writes about this, right? The idea that, okay, if so, maybe maybe there were debates between Augustine and, and, and Jerome about the nature of the Eucharist, and there's all these were all these Baptists throughout history, right? Who are who are seen as symbolic, and the Church just managed to whitewash all of that and remove all those documents. Well, sure, I mean, you know, Rob would say, yeah, you can believe that. That's a massive conspiracy, and kind of seems crazy, but you can believe it if if you'd like to, right? There's just no evidence for for that kind of third way of this this mysteriously erased Church history, right? Yeah, it's so you know, I, I like. I said, I'm working on this stuff, answering Baptist secessionism, which argues that conspiracy. And the stuff that comes out actually contradicts it. So for instance, there was the idea that the Cathars were really Baptists. <laughs> they were misnamed yeah. and their opponents were lying about what they believed. But if you actually were to hear them preach and speak and write, you'd find out that they just believed basically the same things Baptists believe today. And then in the 20th century, we discovered numerous Cathar texts that had been mostly lost, like the two principles. And a 13th century, uh, it's, it's an anonymous text, it's called like the Manichaean text. And 
in it, they talk about how there's two gods, a good God and an evil God. And it's like everything their opponents said, yeah, yeah. they are actually preaching that. And it, it turns out their opponents are fairly accurate in describing their views. And of course they are, right? Like if these are the people saying, hey, don't believe the Cathars when they tell you X, Y, Z, they have to actually address the X, Y, Z the Cathars are saying. So even if all of the Cathar or whatever group, I mean, fill in the blank, texts are gone, if they're all destroyed or if people just stop reading them and, and just get rid of them, you would still have the response text. So until the discovery of the Nagamati Library, the best source on Gnosticism was St. Irenaeus's Against Heresies. He spends so long catalog cataloging what Gnostics believe in order to refute it. And so you can actually piece together, again, it may be inaccurate, it may be skewed in some way, it may be an uncharitable kind of reading, but you're going to get the gist by reading the opponents. And so I think that's just kind of worth bearing in mind uh, that if these people had existed, you would find church definitions on how you have to believe this about the Eucharist. You'd find responses to the Baptist heretics in the fourth century. We don't find any of that stuff. And the reason we don't find any of that stuff is there was no heresy to answer them. Yeah. I get it. So even more, I think, damning, go a level deeper, is the centrality of the Eucharist to the, the new covenant, like the idea of the, yes. the old new covenant, right? I mean, if, okay, so you can say it, it's symbolic. You can hold that that view. It's not really tenable with, with church history. As you've shown us, it's, it's difficult to do and really be historic, right? This is a very new innovation to see this as merely symbolic, uh, as far as we can tell, apart from from a, a global conspiracy, keeping it hidden right. hidden from us, Joe. But then you look at the, the centrality of the Eucharist to the covenants and what's happening in the new covenant and how the Eucharist is so foundational to that understanding. It's really hard. I mean, okay, I'm a convert and it's even hard for me, you know, six, seven, eight years removed from that to understand how I, or to remember, or remind myself how I understood yeah. the new covenant without understanding the Eucharistic, you know, component to that, because it seems like, gosh, you know, I, I had Lawrence Feingold in the show a few weeks back. We're talking about this idea of the new and old covenant, and you, you can't have a new covenant that's, that's worse than the old covenant, yeah. right? You can't, you can't have an old, an old covenant, you know, you know, uh, a religion that had uh, a tabernacle and the presence of God, right, dwelling there. You can't do away with that to have just this symbolic kind of pr presence of, you know, okay, Christ is accessible everywhere to us now through the Holy Spirit. But but not right there, which you know that 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 seems like we're worse off now if we don't we don't have that anymore as Christians. So yeah, that's that's critical. And now I studied under Lawrence Feingold, so I'm sure he's influenced my thinking on this. But <laughs> Hebrews talks about how you know the former things are a shadow of the things to come. Yeah, this notion of foreshadowing isn't just good screenwriting. This notion of foreshadowing <laughs> is good theology. <laughs> and so if the best part is what came before, you know, in the Old Testament. Think about 1 Corinthians 10, St. Paul's explanation of the sacramental economy of the church. He explains that in the Old Testament, you have something like baptism, where you have the Israelites passing through the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, and they're led by the pillar of spirit. So you have water in the spirit. And so Paul says explicitly they were baptized in this moment. Now, he doesn't mean that literally. He's explaining this as a prefigurement of baptism. And then in the desert, they're given supernatural food and drink. He says this as well in 1 Corinthians 10, because they have the manna from heaven and the water from the rock. And, and Paul even says, and the rock was Christ. And so you have this really dramatic kind of scene where the people on the Exodus are being directly fed by God. And you say, if this is foreshadowing of some even better reality, what in the world is that? And it doesn't seem there's a lot of places to go beyond now we don't just receive food and drink from God. We actually receive God directly in receiving the Eucharist. That's the only step I can imagine above what the Israelites already had in the desert. And if you reject that and say, this is just a symbol, then you have to say the old covenant is better than the new covenant, that God's presence was richer before the coming of Christ than it is now. And that defies the whole logic of the incarnation. It defies everything we understand about the mission of Christ and everything Hebrews talks about, about the foreshadowing. So that's one way of understanding it. 
Another way, also kind of building on the a theology in Hebrews, is it talks about how even the first covenant uh, was not enacted without the shedding of blood. And so here it's important to know two things. First, the story of the creation of the new covenant is the critical story of the New Testament. Yeah. And as proof of this, I would go to the fact that we call it the New Testament, and Testament means covenant. So, you know, I've, I've been giving the example. It's like, if you name a book Lord of the Rings, that tells me the ring is pretty important. <laughs> if you name a book Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I've got a sense of who to watch out for. <laughs> can, I, can I say and, Lord of the Rings? I began that book, uh, you know, as a teenager. I had no idea what, what, what the ring, what is the, what's the, <laughs> got to read the whole thing to understand that. It, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so, no, but that's, that's right on point. And a lot of people read the Bible in the same way, where they're missing all this stuff about the creation of the covenant. But the fact that the earliest Christians call it the New Testament yes, yes, yes. tell us that they understood this as the central theme. And now, given that, so you don't understand Christianity rightly if you don't understand the covenant. Given that, you might imagine Jesus went around every day preaching about the new covenant, but he doesn't. The only time he explicitly addresses the new covenant, one time, is at the Last Supper when he holds yeah, up the chalice yeah, yeah. and declares it the new covenant in his blood. Now, we moderns don't get that because we don't know anything about covenants. But for the creation of a covenant, it typically required actual blood. Yeah, yeah. And Hebrews talks about this as well, when it talks about how even the first covenant wasn't created without blood. It gives the example of Moses sprinkling the people with blood and saying, this is the blood of the covenant. Now, the parallels between that and the Last Supper are so obvious that it's hard to miss. And then you say, okay, well, Moses really had blood and really did create the covenant. Are we to believe that at the Last Supper, Jesus wasn't creating the new covenant? He was just saying, this is a reminder of the new covenant I'm going to create or maybe created else. Like, there's, there's no clear kind of theology of the covenant formation that's faithful to ancient Jewish visions of the creation of a covenant. And, and for that matter, even ancient pagan visions of the covenant. So all that's to say is just as you can't understand Christianity rightly, without understanding the covenant. You also can't understand the covenant rightly without understanding what's going on at the Last Supper. And how do we know that? Because the only time Jesus explicitly addresses the covenant is right there. That you need to make sense of what is he doing here and what does that have to do with the covenant? Yeah, I think that's, that's amazing. And again, I mean, that understanding of... I mean, of a, of a sacrifice of, I mean, I guess as an evangelical, you can understand that, okay, a sacrifice happened, you know, at the cross, obviously, this was instituting the the new covenant, the, you know, Lord's Supper, communion, remembers that, reminds us of that. But that is, is such a uh, kind of truncated understanding mm -hmm. of what a covenant is, that no, that, that act is going to keep going, not just once a month with grape juice and, 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 uh, and, and crackers, right? At... At a, at a communion service, but no, that that's that's central to to how you how you worship, right? How you get together, and we know that also from the early church. We we see that happening right away, right? We sure do, and it, yeah, it's worth bearing this in mind because many Protestants will say, "Aren't you re-sacrificing Christ?" Yeah, yeah. And it's really worth focusing on the fact that the early Christians were emphatic about this being a sacrifice. You find this in the Didache in the first century. You find Saint Paul in First Corinthians ten. Uh, comparing what's happening in the Eucharist to the Jewish temple sacrifices and to the pagan sacrifices. So all of that's going on. And none of that makes sense if this is not a sacrifice. Like if the Eucharist isn't a sacrifice, what are they talking about? But then you say, well, why weren't they worried about re-sacrificing Christ? And to that I would say, because unlike modern Christians, they understood the way a sacrifice worked. And I don't mean that to bash modern Christians. It's kind of to our advantage. Yeah, yeah that we don't live in a culture that has animal sacrifice. But the Jews and the pagans did. And in an animal sacrifice, there were typically two things that happened. You'd have the killing of the lamb. So think about preparation day in the Passover. You have the killing of the lamb. This is a prefigurement of Good Friday, which John tells us in his gospel is preparation day. And then the next day on the Passover, you have the eating of the lamb. That doesn't re-sacrifice the lamb that completes and applies the sacrifice. That is a participation in the sacrifice. The lamb isn't like doubly dead now. <laughs> that, that part, the slaying of the sacrificial animal has already happened, but the completion of the sacrifice is 
eating the animal. And so, just as in the Passover, you have those two dimensions, preparation and Passover meal. So in Holy Week, you've got the two dimensions, Calvary and the Last Supper. And so when we continue to participate in the Last Supper, we're not disobeying Christ. We're literally obeying. He says, do this, and we're doing it. He doesn't tell us to redo Calvary. That's impossible. It's once for all. But the Last Supper dimension is meant to happen in perpetuity at the command of the Lord. And so this is an important thing to understand. If you lose this, if you lose the sacramental schema, you end up with kind of the arbitrary nature you find in a lot of Protestantism, where this is an ordinance, where you do it because you're told to do it, but it just seems like an arbitrary rule. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's not clear why do I need to be doing this. You know, if it's just a symbol, what if I find another symbol more helpful? Nope, you have to do this one. You have to like this metaphor. And it's like, why? St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 talks about how if you do it unworthily, you eat and drink damnation upon yourself. If that's just a metaphor. I mean, imagine if I said, hey, I've got this metaphor, and if you don't like it, you need to go to hell. <laughs> you would say, that's unreasonable. Well, likewise, if this is just a symbol, give me a break. Why would this be damnable? And there's plenty of, you know, parables Jesus provides where you can look at that and say, I don't find this particular parable very helpful. I don't find it clear. I don't get what's going on with, you know, the unjust steward say, okay, that's fine. Another one might hammer home the same point in a different way. But here with the Eucharist, we're not giving this as one symbol among many. This isn't just an ordinance we have to legalistically follow. No, this is a sacrament and a sacrifice that we're invited into. Yeah, you know, I so I went to university and lived for a while in a Mennonite uh, dorm residence. It was an awful, awful. It was an awesome community. It was an awful. It was wonderful. I met my wife there, and one of the things that so we'd occasionally observe kind of Mennonite things happening around around the building, and they'd have chapel once in a while and these kind of things. And one thing that that often struck me is they'd wash feet quite regularly mm -hmm. in a Mennonite service. And I thought, okay, well, Jesus says, you know, I'm making an example for you. Like, this is an yeah. example. And I thought, well, why don't we, as non-denominational Christians, you know, we're doing the Lord's Supper once a month. We're doing the, the grape juice and, and the bread. We're, you know, we're reading Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we also doing this, this foot washing that the Mennonites over here are doing regularly <laughs> alongside of communion? And that never made a lot of sense to me, just from a plain reading Mm -hmm. of, of scripture, right? But of course, you know, you, you go and look at, at, at church history and and look at a proper understanding of, of well, when did, you know, Jesus didn't in, inaugurate the, the the covenant with the foot washing, right? And right. The, the early church didn't take that and, and do that every single time they got, got together, right? In, in context, those things are very, very different, right? And I, yeah, I think, and so I think that's a good example because that is a symbolic example. He's telling us to serve one another. He's not telling us to literally yeah, yeah. wash each other's feet. It's a helpful symbol. You know, we do it once a year at, at Holy Thursday. Yeah. Uh, it's the Mass of the Last Supper. We're reminded with the washing of the feet that the greatest among you is one who serves and that Christ is among us as one who serves. And so we should do likewise. And so very clearly, he's not telling us to wash feet literally. He's telling us to serve one another. And so that is something that we should take very seriously as a commandment. Whether that includes washing someone else's feet is not necessary. And in fact, I would say extremely unlikely in the modern context. So what you're called to do is, is wash someone's feet. Now, maybe, you know, if they're disabled, they can't wash their own. But the foot washing is not the point. What the foot yeah. washing symbolizes is the point. As you say, that's totally different than the Eucharist, where it's not just do something to remember me. You know, try to find a memorial that, that's meaningful yeah, for you. Yeah. Let this kind of inspire you to be creative. No, there's none of that. It's, it's do this. And we see a, a real serious theology around don't do this wrong. And all of that makes sense if this is really what it appears to be according to 2,000 years of Catholic interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the Eucharist being the key to worship? And I came across a really interesting thing uh, recently from the Catholic brothers, uh, Daniel and Stephen. I've been in the show before. They have an awesome little uh, podcast, YouTube channel of their own, do doing some really interesting deep dives into 
in, in topics of of interest, you know, exorcism, and uh, they they are part of the great big uh, veneration of of saints and uh, um, and images debate that it exploded on, on YouTube yeah. a, few, a, while, a while ago. They were a key part of that and had some awesome things to, to contribute. And they they recently wrote, and this this was interesting to me. That the the main this is about Mary, but I think it also applies to the Eucharist, and, and again central to how we worship as Catholics, right? The the idea that, and they wrote that they think the the problem that Protestants have with you know Catholics looking like they're worshiping uh, saints and, and Mary is that is that Protestants don't understand what worship is and don't actually really worship in like a Protestant uh, you know church service because what they're doing is is veneration because it, you know it, it, it lacks. The, the Eucharist, for example, and a right understanding of worship. And I think that's not quite what we're talking about here, but I think it's interesting because there there is that lack, there, there, a lack of understanding of what worship actually is directed towards the Eucharist in a mass versus what's happening in a Protestant church service. I mean, we'd have a thing called worship and it would be singing songs to Jesus. That's different than you know, an actual sacrifice in, in the Eucharist, a uh, part of the, the, the new covenant. Uh, does that make sense? It does. I want to nuance it a little bit because I think it's possible to go too far. We want to preserve sure, the yeah. fact, I, frankly, I think there are elements of Protestant worship that are often the parts Protestants don't think of as worship. Sure. Now we can talk about even a sacrifice of praise. So there could be a sense in which that can be a sacrificial. In chapter five of the book, I, I take to task a different strain of Protestantism more, uh, I don't want to say dry, more like the reformed <laughs> liturgical style of worship and some Baptists. So I quote O.S. Hawkins in the book. Now, O.S. Hawkins is a pretty prominent uh, Baptist preacher, and he talks about uh, having had the opportunity to preach behind what he describes as uh, the most, if one of the most, if not the most influential 20th century pulpits in the Western world. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not a Baptist. But he goes on to say that pulpit, like most pulpits in Baptist life, stands in the middle of the building on center stage, so to speak. It is there to make a statement that central to Baptist worship is the preaching of the book of God to the people of God. Proclamation, the preaching of the gospel, should be central to Christian worship. Now, that's, then he says, oh yeah, I'll go on. The sermon is the central dynamic in the worship experience. All of that is totally wrong. And I, I want to address that view particularly because preaching is good. Preaching on scripture is good. The liturgy of the word is great. That by itself is not worship. Yeah. And so many of the Protestants I saw that would kind of defend this liturgically would say it's like synagogue worship. Well, the problem is the synagogue wasn't a place of worship yeah. at the time of oh, Jesus. Yeah. It becomes a place of Jewish worship after the destruction of the temple in 70, but it's not during Jesus's day. And how do we know this? Well, for one, from things like first century synagogue inscriptions, where they explain what they are and what they're about. And so there's a, a pretty famous one, which explains it's a, a hostel for travelers, and it's a place for the reading of the law. There's no reference to prayer, and much less is there a reference to worship. So we have to keep three things straight, teaching and preaching, Prayer and worship. Teaching and preaching is talking about God. That's what happens at a pulpit. You don't need to even talk to God to do that. Teaching and preaching is public and it's orientation. You know, Paul and Barnabas go into the synagogue. You'll go to a marketplace, you'll go into public. You know, this the whole point of it is you're trying to reach people. You're talking to other people. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. And so the only connection we see between prayer and the synagogue in the New Testament, the only time those two things are mentioned together is in Matthew 6, when Jesus warns against those who go into the synagogue and marketplace to pray because they're hypocrites. They just like you, you know, you were supposed to go into the synagogue and marketplace to preach because you're trying to reach people. If you're praying so that as many people as possible see you, you know, take a modern example. I use social media to proclaim Jesus as effectively as I can. But if I started making a bunch of Facebook posts and YouTube videos where it's just me praying, then I think people would reasonably say, it looks like you just want people to see how holy you are. <laughs> and that's deeply unholy. Like that is just pride. And that's what Jesus is warning against. 
when you're being public and ostentatious about your prayer. Now, this isn't a total bar to public prayer. There's a time and place for it. In John 11, Jesus prays publicly outside the tomb of Lazarus and makes sure everybody can hear him and, and announces that he's doing that in the prayer. And so public prayer is, is fine in the right time and place. But the point of prayer is talking to God, and that can and generally should be something that happens privately. Then you want to distinguish, but even that, so you've got like the upper room, you've got Jesus going to a quiet place. That can happen anywhere. It's not something that happens in the synagogue in kind of the Christian schema. But then you've got another place, which is the temple. In John 4, Jesus and the Samaritan woman talk about this. And the Samaritan woman makes the point that as a Samaritan, she believes that worship happens on this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim. And that for the Jews, it happens in Jerusalem, which is to say in the temple. And Jesus doesn't disagree with that. He says a time is coming where it will be offered in spirit and truth. We'll get into what that means. But before, just notice there is something distinct from prayer that could only happen in the temple. And what is that? It's sacrificial worship. Because worship isn't just talking to God like prayer is. Worship is offering to God. And in English, it comes from worthyship. You are giving God his worth. And how do we do that? Through sacrifice. Now, there is a sense in which the place of worship shifts uh, in the new covenant. And now we can offer this anywhere. You can have mass anywhere around the world. And so Malachi chapter one, verse 11 talks about true offering. That is true sacrifice being made from the rising of the sun to its setting. And the earliest Christian sources, including the Didache in the first century, point to this as an explanation for why they can have Christian sacrificial worship, which is to say the Eucharist anywhere and everywhere because they don't have to have it in Jerusalem in the temple now. It can be in any church, any home around the world, just as was promised in the Old Testament. That, that's what would happen. But notice, this is the offering of sacrifice. This only makes sense if Christian worship is sacrificial worship. Now, we want to go even beyond that and say there's a sense in which your own body is itself a temple. So just as there's corporate worship with the Eucharist, there's also bodily worship. Romans 12 talks about this, that we offer up our sufferings in our body, and this is our spiritual worship. And so those are the sacrifices that we make. Uh, so we want to keep those two things together. So in other words, when you're loving and serving another person, there's one sense in which we can talk about that as sacrificial worship. When you are offering songs and prayers to God, there's one sense in which we can talk about that as sacrificial worship, the sacrifice of praise. But the heart of Christian worship for 2,000 years was not just me offering my own bodily sacrifice, but being united to the sacrifice of Christ himself. And that happens in a unique way in the Eucharist. Yeah, <laughs> that's well said, Joe. I remember having uh, Father Joshua Caswell on the show, a good Canadian guy, the Superior General of the Cannes Regular of St. John Cantus in Chicago. Uh, you know, a, a prominent guy with a good head in his shoulders, and he's a former charismatic uh, evangelical. Actually, his, his family moved up to northern Canada to start a mission up there and actually were evangelized by the indigenous people who were there who were Catholics. The yeah. Jesuits had, had you know evangelized like hundreds of years ago. They came up there as evangelicals. The whole thing they left as Catholics because they were evangelized by the indigenous <laughs> yeah. Catholics up there. And he, he said for him as a, as a priest celebrating mass, like, you know, that is the most charismatic thing that he said he's ever done in his life is the idea because because Christ comes and, and, and dwells among us. You know, we can we can yeah. consume him, we can worship him. And all these songs we'd sing as as charismatic evangelicals would, you know, longing for more of God and, and, and Jesus' presence and come among us and dwell in us. All these things are fulfilled in in the Eucharist, in a worship experience that we were only longing for, you know, as, as Pentecostal Christians. Well, here it's fulfilled, right? Yeah. In, in the high the highest way. Yeah. I, I was really convicted about this. Um, back in college, I, well, college and law school, I, I dated a young woman who was Assemblies of God, who was, you know, very much charismatic, who became Catholic, uh, kind of during the time I knew her before we started dating. But she had really made this point when I was kind of talking to her ahead of time before she converted. Like, you know, you Catholics are really big on miracles. <laughs> we don't talk about it the same way. But you believe a miracle happens every day at Mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like miracles are dead in the Catholic yeah, schema. That's, that's... This is a different kind of framework than we often think about it. But it's like, yeah, of course. Yeah. 
And then that doesn't even get into all the other miraculous stuff that we believe in, but at just the Eucharistic level. Yeah, this is everything charismatics are wanting. Hey, yeah. God, make yourself present in some real bodily kind of way. Well, great, this happens in the incarnation, yeah. and this is continued in the body of Christ, yeah. both in the body of Christ, the Eucharist, and in another mysterious way in the body of Christ, the church. So, yeah, this is really rich and really incredible, really, I think, a beautiful and profound thing. And unfortunately, you're right. Like, a lot of Protestants have altar calls and no altars. Yes. Yeah. And so there's a kind of calling people to something they can't satisfy uh, that— no, no, all this language of come to the altar is actually fulfilled in Catholicism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you one more question, but I want to leave it right there. That's a perfect way to end, I think, this conversation. Okay, great. <laughs> With an altar call to come to the real altar. Amen. That, 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 that's great. I love that, Joe. Uh, I love all your stuff, and I'll put links to everything in the show notes uh, for this, right. this show. Your podcast, all your books, every, everything. Uh, it's it's awesome, Joe. Anywhere in particular you want to point people towards, though, uh, to, to think more about this topic other than, you know, getting your book on, on mass, hopefully? Yeah, I mean, definitely get the book on mass. If you want to get, like, a case of 20, you can get it for 70 bucks on shop.catholic.com. That's $3.50 a book. <laughs> this is not about me getting rich uh, and keeping my kids ensconced in caviar. You know, like, we're just, <laughs> we want as many people to read this as possible. Uh, and then the the podcast, you already mentioned it, Shameless Popery. That's a, a good place to find, you know, whatever the latest thing is that pops to the top of my head that I <laughs> decide to do an episode on. And and it's been a real fun ride. So I appreciate the opportunity to kind of share, but those would be the, the two places I'd point people. That's wonderful, Joe. Listen, awesome book, awesome work. Thank you, Joe. Thank I want to say God bless you and the work you're doing for the church. I know we just had a, you know, we have a four, four week old upstairs at home. It gets Oh, exhausting. yeah, I totally forgot. I'm so sorry. Congratulations. Hey, oh, well, the, it's okay. I for, thank you. I guess better for me to forget than you. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And, and you know what? Like, you know, Joy. It does you know? I, I forget her. I forget her in safe places. Like she's in the, she's in the, you know, in, in the. Because I don't like, like leave her in the, in the corner somewhere. But I don't know how know, Canada is. What? I'd be worried about announcing this on the air. You're gonna get a, a phone call or a door knock. Uh, she's people. in the. I should erase this part of the podcast. Probably. I think. I think <laughs> you're right, Joe. On that note, God bless you, Joe, and the work you're doing for the church. And thank uh, you. And uh, thanks for. Oh, doing if, it in, actually, in, if I can solicit prayers, uh, we're. We've got a baby doing it literally a week. So, yeah. So maybe prayers for both of our newborn children. <laughs> That's wonderful, Joey. And through the magic of time travel, th that baby will, Lord willing, be maybe a month old when this comes out. So, <laughs> yes. But we believe that those prayers are efficacious, even in Amen. reverse, the timey-wimey. That's awesome, Joe. <laughs> God bless, Joe. Thanks for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.